Dion, I think we should go to our, our next slide. So it just, um, I'm Mark Cuthbert with Friends of Samyama Bay, and I would like to welcome everyone um, to this um, to this World Ocean Day uh, webinar. We do try to do something relevant um, and and timely, and um, so so what I would like to do is start with our. Um, acknowledgments of our South Coast Salish people. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the um, Mansqui, Kwantlen, Katsi, and Semiamu First Nations and other South uh, Coast Salish folks um, uh, whose land we live and work. And uh, this, it, it, we're very, very, um, um, I'm just checking to see, make sure that the um, things are working here. So I'd like to introduce Deanne Watson um, on our, our uh, webinar today, who is going to introduce our amazing um, fellow green crab trappers. And uh, we're so appreciative of them coming on board and, and uh, doing this with us today. And uh, Deanne, has been uh, coordinating the project with me. And um, so uh, questions can also be uh, diverted to, to Deanne as well. Deanne, would you like to introduce our speakers? Yeah, thank you, Marg. So we've got a couple presenters today. Um, first up is going to be uh, Leah and Ali uh, from Northwest Straits Commission. Um, they'll be uh, presenting on their collaborative green crab management in Drayton Harbor in Blaine, Washington. Uh, so Ali holds a master's in marine and estuarine science from uh, Western University, or sorry, Western Washington University, uh, where she studied eelgrass ecology. She joined the Northwest Straits Commission in 2020 and since has participated on a variety of nearshore projects, including the coordinated uh, European green crab management efforts in North Puget Sound and uh, implementing eelgrass protection zones across the Salish Sea. Uh, Leah is a ecosystem project specialist for the Northwest Straits Commission. She's currently pursuing her master's in land resources and uh, environmental sciences through the Montana State University. And for the Northwest Straits Commission, she helps coordinate a monitoring and removal effort of invasive European green crab in Drayton Harbor. Um, we'll also have Krista Stubbs from the Coastal Restoration Society joining us. Uh, she'll chat about the South Coast European Green Crab Project on, the, on Vancouver Island area. Uh, Krista is a senior project manager and biologist with Coastal Restoration Society. Um, as a lead for her science department, she works directly with Indigenous governments and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to control and mitigate the spread of European green crab within the Pacific region. Um, so we're really fortunate to have these presenters here and to learn about their efforts um, managing the green crab as we are starting to do the same thing here in um, the south coast of BC, um, in White Rock, particularly. So, yeah. Uh, yeah and, um, excuse me, just for a moment. I I'm sorry. I I think that was a great intro. I just forgot to introduce um, uh, Carly, who's with the City of Surrey, and this webinar is a part of the Environmental Extravaganza program. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Carly, could you like to say hello? And I think you had a comment. Um, we do acknowledge at the end of the webinar, but uh, would you like to say hello to everyone before we get started? Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Hi, um, Carly here with the City of Surrey. I just want to say thanks everybody for attending the Alien Green Crab Destroyer Lunch and Learn webinar. And a big shout out and thank you to our friends of Semiyama Bay Society for putting this webinar on today. This is the final week of our environmental extravaganza programming. We've got a, about 11 programs left before the end of the week. And this is a great start to World Oceans Day. So thanks so much. I'm really excited to tune into the webinar today. And thanks for everybody to attending and partnering with our environmental extravaganza. Thank you. Thanks, Carly. 
please go ahead, Dan. That is all I had for introductions. So I think we could probably start with our first presenters, which is gonna be uh, Ali and Leah. Stop sharing here. Great, thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm going to go ahead and get my screen shared here. And hopefully you can see just the presentation and not any notes, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, like um, Deanne was saying, I'm Allie and my partner in crime is Leah and she, you'll see her on the list of um, all of the, the images that we have, all of the pictures of everybody's faces on, on the Zoom call. Um, and we are with the Northwest Straits Commission on the uh, Washington side of the Salish Sea. And because um, I'm assuming many people are unaware of who we are, I wanted to give a really quick introduction as to what it is we do and you know, how we fit into this whole um, green crab world. And so we are with the Northwest Straits Commission, which is one arm of the Northwest Straits Initiative. So we're the government branch of this arm. We work closely with the Northwest Straits Foundation, which is our nonprofit arm. And together we support um, a volunteer led county based marine resources committees. And so they are the heart of this, the initiative really. And the marine resources committees um, serve as uh, local advisors on marine issues to their, their county councils. And the initiative itself was created to protect and restore marine waters species and habitats of the Northwest Straits to achieve ecosystem health and sustainable resource use through a local-based approach. And we really think that local-based approach is what helps sets us apart. Um, like I said, it, the, the heart of the initiative and the work that we really do is focused on what volunteers and community members want to see happen. And so all of our projects are really based on their input. And that's kind of how we got into this role of green crab management. Um, we are we serve as a local coordinator for the Drayton Harbor area, and we really felt like increasing the trapping and outreach efforts through a collaborative approach could help limit the impact of invasive European green crabs within the Salish Sea. And so, uh, because we're so used to just building those relationships with local organizations and volunteers, we worked really hard to, to build those relationships within Drayton Harbor. And so we worked closely with other agencies, organizations, nonprofits, um, tribes, uh, community members, landowners, and volunteers to really help build a robust management program focused on both trapping and outreach efforts. And, um, just to really emphasize how important the collaborative effort really is to us. In 2022, we had over 50 different people come out to help us with the trapping. Um, so these are all people that slogged in the mud with us. Um, everybody from uh, retirees and volunteers, college students, um, uh, tribal representatives, uh, nonprofits, um, it's just a really big effort for us. And we do work really hard to make sure that it's a, a collaborative in nature. And, you know, along with the actual trapping efforts, something that we work closely with on, with the Wacom Marine Resources Committee is um, public outreach. So the outreach efforts are equally as important as the trapping efforts with green crab management. Um, and just in case people are unaware that I know most people on this call should, should probably know, uh, the distinguishing features of an invasive green crab are that they have these five spines on either side of its eye. And that's something that we um, try to relate to any member of the public that comes up and asks us about what we're doing. And uh, we try to really uh, focus in our outreach efforts on that species identification. And that those two aspects coupled together are 
just incredibly important for management efforts to begin with. Um, and, you know, we care so much about this issue because you know, the, the rich and productive ecosystem of the Salish Sea could be dramatically altered if we allowed green crabs to take um, hold and get into really high numbers of abundance. And so if we allowed green crabs to take um, hold, we would go from this beautiful graphic on the left to the graphic on the right, where green crabs would compete with dungeon, juvenile dungeness crabs. They could eat our shellfish like clams, mussels, and oysters. They could um, tear up the eelgrass beds, and um, which serve as vital habitat for juvenile salmon and uh, service foraging grounds for a lot of our um, migratory birds and other waterfowl. And um, humans also depend on these areas as well for recreation and protection and sustenance. And so by you know, allowing green crabs to take hold, um, we would lose a lot of that productivity of the Salish Sea. And because we are the first presentation going, I wanted to give a quick overview of how they even got into the Salish Sea to begin with. Um, they are native to Europe and they arrived to the East Coast, uh, the US East Coast in the mid 1800s, made it into the East Coast of Canada in the early 1900s, traveled all the way over to um, San Francisco Bay and were first discovered in 1989 and followed the currents up um, into Washington and Vancouver Island in 1998-1999. And so for us in the Washington part of the Salish Sea, we started to see a lot of the crabs show up in places around 2016, 2017, and then in 2019, where in 2019 is where we found our first detection of green crab in Drayton Harbor, which is right on the border, um, right by Semiami Bay and Boundary Bay. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Leah to talk about um, the efforts that are actually happening in Drayton Harbor. Hi everyone. Thank you, Allie. Yeah, so from that last map, we saw those detections throughout the Washington side of the Salish Sea. And part of that was due to a really great early detection network by Washington Sea Grant. And then um, when they were first detected in Drayton Harbor in 2019, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife did a rapid response survey. And that's where we kind of realized Drayton Harbor was a hotspot for green crab at that time. And so um, I, the collaborative program that Ali talked about was developed with a management plan, and that has been going on since 2020. And that's, you know, many partners, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Northwest Straits Commission, volunteers, and many more. Um, and just a kind of aside is that the, the first crab was found by a volunteer who was just trained on how to identify. She wasn't volunteering for a green crab program. She was volunteering for a different program, but had, had learned about green crab. And when she found a molt, she knew who to contact and knew how to ID it. And that's how this, how it was found. So a really important piece of our, we've learned from that, but that's an important piece of the puzzle. All right, so I wanna just kind of go into our, um, how our trapping effort works. And so we set traps during low tide and we bait them with mackerel. And then we set about 30 traps per site. And then we can go to about two to four sites per day. And then every trap, um, we often um, set them for multiple nights in a row, but we let we check them daily. And so we always um, ID non-target species and we count them and then we release those unharmed. If we catch a green crab, we take photos of the ventral and dorsal side so we can track every crab that we've caught. And then we take, um, we take biometric data for every crab we capture. So the size, sex, um, barnacles, and its condition, and then it's humanely euthanized and sent to Washington Sea Grant, who does uh, studies on their gut contents and some DNA analysis. And then the last step of the process is the cleanup and decontamination of traps and equipment. And 
a messy one, but also really important so that we're not moving any other um, invasive species around if we do end up trapping in different water bodies. All right, so our results for 2022. Um, overall, our trapping program captured 313 green crabs and uh, set 2,875 traps, um, which resulted in a catch rate of 10.9 when you combine all the trap types. And so that's um, number of green crab per 100 trap sets is the metric for the catch rate. And that's also sometimes referred to as the CPUE. In addition to all of the crabs we captured um, in Drayton Harbor last year, there, there's an oyster grower company in Drayton Harbor that's been a great partner, and they also found seven, seven green crabs on their growing areas, as well as two reports from the public, and we did some follow-up trapping once we heard that there was a, a confirmed report from the public. So trapping occurred throughout Drayton Harbor, but one way to standardize our data collection is through these core site monitoring sites. And so this allows us to better compare the catch rates between sites and between years. Um, so this is just a map example of a core site setup in the north end of the harbor where traps are placed consistently in those locations every time we go out and trap. And that is all very suitable habitat for green crab. We also set traps in specific hotspots that are really heavily targeted for that green crab removal. And that included kind of a derelict dock structure and some derelict pier structures that the green crabs just really seem to love. So we target that with some of the other um, shrimp traps. All right, and so our results for the past um, four years of trapping with a little bit of 2023 data thrown in there as well. And so, as you can see, the 2022 season had fairly low capture rates throughout the year until September. And that's when there was a dramatic increase where we were catching a lot of young of the year crab. Um, and that was a bit of a surprise. So I was curious to see what we would, what would come, what we would come up with trapping early season this year. And so far we've removed 68 green crab um, in the few weeks that we've been out trapping this year, um, but only nine of those in the core site monitoring. And so the capture rates are relatively similar to 2021 capture rates at those core sites. All right, and um, Allie, can you click on, thanks. So in addition to the green crabs we capture, um, most of what we're doing out there is collecting a really robust data set on the biodiversity out at the sites we're trapping in. And so of those 2,875 trap set, sets, we counted and ID'd 45,500 uh, different critters, which is a lot of different species to go through and count. Um, and so the majority of those are, you know, native crabs with only, with less than 1% being green crabs. And so, um, yeah, from this, you can see that it's not just about removing, it is removing the green crabs, but we're collecting a lot of other important data when we're out there as well. And thank you. That brings us to the end of our presentation. So I think we have a few minutes for questions, maybe. Um, I have a question. I don't know if anyone else does. Um, I'll just talk. Um, it's interesting to me, uh, Leah and Allie, that you have a number of trappings in one day um that that's interesting we what we do is we have site leaders for four sites and then they have volunteers sign up with them and they go out on particular days and what they're trying to do is do two trappings a month uh, from april to september now i see from you you're, it looks like you're doing once a month and it looked like um you're you're putting a lot of traps out in one day that that's quite a, a different protocol isn't it do you feel it's a lot more effective uh, than what we're doing or what are you thinking? Because uh, we're, we're following DFO 
And it sounds like you guys are following Washington Department Fish and Wildlife. Nadia, do you want to take that? Sure, sure. Yeah, our we have you know dedicated staff to this versus only a volunteer program. So that does allow us to be out in the field for you know eight hours a day, four days, five days in a row, and we try and time that with the tides. So we're going out and doing this intensive uh, removal action. Um, about twice a month with our crews. And we also have a Washington Conservation Corps crew. And so they really help with that field work because it is intensive and, you know, asking, that would be asking a lot for volunteers. And so um, the two areas we have these kind of intensive monitoring and removal efforts are in Samish Bay and Drayton Harbor. And so those are where we are focused on kind of removing as many green crabs as we can. Thank you. I think there was a question. Yeah, there's a question from Susan and Walter. You wanna? Yes, uh, the, the, here we are on Vancouver Island, but my experience is mostly on the north coast by the Alaska boundary. I understand some have even made it that far. Is that correct, is, to your knowledge? Yes, yeah, they have. I think just last year was the first record of green crabs being caught in that area um so yeah. they they have been spreading uh, right okay so there's a greater awareness even in the north but of course here in the south now barkley sound and on the west coast of vancouver island uh, ended up with this first ones in the northwest it looks like it, it has that uh, what's the situation at barkley sound are, are there monitoring sites is it bad uh, any ideas now soup basin is a heavily um uh, populated and and a uh, large amount of recreation and and uh, fishing from crab traps and stuff i'm assuming at a place like soup basin that there would be an invasive green uh, crab project or two underway already am i correct i think so and i think krista is actually going to be speaking directly on that so oh, yeah you, oh, okay. you are leading straight into the next presentation oh Look good okay i didn't realize that sorry um, no, okay so um i'll be quiet for now so um but there's lots uh to worry about but there's lots being done too is what you're saying yes exactly yeah there's a lot of collaborative efforts um besides our group there's a lot of efforts within washington and i know a lot of efforts within bc that are working closely together um and just on this issue itself. So yeah, that's a great question. I know Krista will cover a lot of that, that part of the question too. Thank you for your question. Uh, we have another one in the chat um, from Patty. How many volunteer teams, age groups are involved in the States as you have staff doing plenty? Do you get environmental university or college students and like summer workers? That's a really great question. Yeah, there's, um, because there are so many different groups working on green crab, there's, there is the Washington Sea Grant Crab Team, which is a completely volunteer um, program where they have, they go to 55 different sites within the Washington part of the Salish Sea. And so um, I'm not exactly sure how many volunteers they have. They have quite a few over, a hundred different volunteers helping with that. And they go to their sites once per month um, for monitoring efforts. And we work really closely with um, you know, college age students uh, through the Washington Conservation Corps program, which is it's a it's a type of like AmeriCorps or program. So something like Peace Corps, something like that, um, that's Washington based. And we also have a a Veterans Conservation Corps um, intern that works with us fairly frequently on, um, and that program is similar. It's just dedicated for uh, veterans. Um, and yeah, we have our own volunteer program, um, plus a lot of the other, other groups are building other volunteer programs to help just monitor for green crab. There's a new program through the, uh, Washington State University called Molt Search, and that's to help 
get people just to be walking along the beach and looking for green crab molds, um, similar to what happened in Drayton Harbor, you know, that can lead to finding a whole new um, uh, hot spot, uh, you know, wherever you are. So yeah, there's a lot of different organizations, a lot of volunteers, a lot of people um, involved with it in, in one way or another. Great. Thanks, Ali. And thank you for your question, Patty. Um, I had a question, if no one else does. Um, that spike in 2022, I think it was, the numbers that went up quite a bit. I'm not sure if I maybe missed it, but is there, do you think there's a reason for that increase in numbers? We saw that increase both in Brayton Harbor and Samish Bay and I don't know. I don't know the exact reason, but it just showed that it was a good a good breeding year for them that they were able to reproduce and and we had a lot of the small crabs that showed up that year versus um, in 2021. I think we only caught you know four or five young of the year crab versus um, over a hundred last year. Cool. Oh, thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, uh, we could move on to Krista Stubbs and her project on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Sure, yeah, sounds good. Just let me know when you folks can see my screen. Looks good so far. Nice, all good there? Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thanks for the warm welcome, uh, Deanne and Marg, and, and thanks to, yeah, Friends of Semiahu Bay and City of Surrey and UBC. This is great, and yeah, really happy to be here and chat with everyone today. Um, yeah, my name is Krista Stubbs. My pronouns are she, her, and today I'm calling in from the traditional and ceded territory of the Tolquit First Nations here in what is sunny Tofino. Um, where part of the project called the South Coast European Green Crab Control Project is based out of. So I'll be mostly talking about this project today, but a little bit about Coastal Restoration Society, which um, was mentioned is the organization that I work for. We're based out of Port Alberni, Vancouver Island, but yeah, work all over the island on the east coast of Canada as well, and on the mainland of BC. So this project or the South Coast EGCCP is a collaborative effort between uh, the Tloquiet, Housett and Souk First Nations, as well as the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And we are funded by the British Columbia Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund. So just a, a quick little blurb about who the Coastal Restoration Society is or CRS as I'll call it for the rest of the presentation. So. We're a relatively small organization, but growing fairly quickly since 2017. So we specialize in large scale coastal restoration initiatives. So we do a lot of derelict vessel removal, aquaculture site remediation, ghost gear removal, shoreline cleanups, and AIS monitoring and control as well. So in the picture here, you can see what a lot of the work we do is kind of looks like this photo here. So removing large abandoned boats, sometimes removing old abandoned oyster farms, things like that. So large scale um, remediation in the marine space. So this project started as just shoreline cleanups in Clackwood Sound. There was an organization called Clackwood Cleanup, which was just a large um, cleanup along the shores of Clackwood Sound here, Vargas Island, areas like that. And yeah, just through working with our Indigenous partners and realizing there's a lot of room for other projects in larger scale restoration, we kind of grew from there, working with Tolquit and Housit and Heshquit, and now have really spread out across the island and other areas in Canada. As I mentioned, yeah, we just kind of noticed the, the need and the gaps in large scale remediation, which has allowed us to apply for a lot of grants, work with Transport Canada, Government of Canada, Province of BC, um, and Indigenous government to amp up our organization. So one thing that I, I do really want to talk about that's really important, especially to this project, is CRS's First Nations First approach. So um, this basically means that all of our projects are based in the wants and needs of our Indigenous partners, 
So Sierra sort of comes in and provides administrative and logistic support to uphold the, the needs and the wants of the nations and what they'd see, like to see done in their traditional territories um, with focus on the marine space. So we provide a lot of grant application support, um, hiring and things like that. And, and all jobs and opportunities through the projects that we're funded for are offered and provided to um, Indigenous folks first, primarily folks who are from um, the territories that we work on. So these are just a few of our partners. As I mentioned, we work closely with First Nations, other nonprofits. We have um, an abundance of private industry partners, work with local governments, provincial governments, federal governments, and other international governments as well. Yeah, a lot of the ways that we build capacity is we, as we're based in a nonprofit, we're based from project to project, but we do really prioritize and make sure that we leave room in our projects for training and capacity building, particularly within Indigenous, remote Indigenous communities. As I mentioned, these are some of our projects. So today I'm mostly going to be talking about our aquatic invasive species program or green crab, which um, Leah and Ali so kindly introduced as well. So I'll kind of keep my introduction to green crab pretty brief as yeah, it seems like most people on the call know all about those already. But yeah, as, as we mentioned, invasive species of shore crab um, and they're present on Vancouver Island as um, who was it was mentioning? Walter maybe was mentioning, yeah, they first came to Vancouver Island. They were detected in Barkley Sound in 1999 and have really taken hold, especially on the west coast of Vancouver Island, um, where they really seem to thrive in the deep estuaries that we have here on the coast. Um, one of the biggest concerns for us and why we're funded for salmon restoration funding is their impact on eelgrass. So we have seen, based on Indigenous knowledge and some historical surveying that areas that used to have eelgrass don't anymore. We can't yet link that exactly to green crab, but now through this project, we've really seen the intense density of green crab here, specifically on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So this is a really big concern for us is the impact that green crab have on eelgrass, which was also mentioned, they do outcompete native crab species. So here, we're looking at purple shore crab, hairy shore crab, and then commercially important species like juvenile dungeness and graceful crabs are also a concern here. And they also predate on bivalve shellfish and clams, which was already mentioned, but definitely a concern for food, social, and ceremonial fisheries for our Indigenous partners, and also a concern for commercial fisheries too. So the project that I'm speaking about is the South Coast Green Crab Control Project. So the, the purpose of this project looks a little bit different. So we're looking in really high density areas of green crab, and we're working with DFO and our nation partners to test the efficacy of industrial style trapping as a way to decrease the populations of green crab and keep those populations low. So this is definitely a pilot project. We've been running since 2021. In November, we started trapping, but a big part of this is to look at, okay, does industrial trapping work to decrease the numbers at all? And so there's been a lot of experimentation and trap design and placement and things like that. And the focus is definitely on coming up with the most effective way to manage green crab in um, British Columbia. As I mentioned, yeah, goal is to mitigate and remediate the damage green crab pose. So we want to see how we can decrease their numbers and keep them low so that ideally we can um, allow the environments that are really important for juvenile salmon and a lot of other native species to thrive again without the intense pressure that it is being put on by green crab here in BC. And also through this project, a big focus of ours is creating long-term and meaningful employment opportunities for Indigenous folks. As I mentioned, yeah, we're focusing on controlling um, high density populations, but we are also getting a little bit more into early detection efforts over on the east coast of Vancouver Island, but mostly today I'll be talking about um, our industrial targeted trapping program. So as you can see here from this map, these are the two areas that we're trapping within. So Clackwood Sound and Souk Basin are our pilot project locations. These are kind of interesting locations and really interesting for comparing as well, because 
folks who aren't familiar with the coast of Vancouver Island, if you look down south there in the Souk Basin, that's what we're calling a closed system. So there's actually no evidence that um, there's natural recruitment of green crab to the Souk Basin. It was human mediated. And over time, this is actually still shown to be a genetically independent location. So no other green crabs coming in. It's all been that self-sustaining population growing off of that human mediated introduction, as opposed to Clockwood Sound, which as you can see is a big open coast with a lot of those deep inlets. So there's constant recruitment coming in and larval recruitment from other areas on the coast, which is quite different from Souk. So not only are we looking at how industrial targeted trapping can work just to control or decrease populations of green crab, but also comparing between Souk and Clackwood Sound. And as I mentioned, the Ahousat First Nation and Poloquit First Nations are the territories we're trapping in in Clackwit and the South First Nations are who we're trapping with in Souk Basin. Um, yeah, so BC Thrift funds our project. We started in November of 2021 and that project runs to June, 2023. So this month, luckily I'm happy to announce that we are receiving additional funding from this round of BC Thrift. So they did release some more funding. And so we're still in the process of going through and getting our contribution agreement signed. But yeah, really, really excited that we're actually not gonna have to stop trapping this month, which we were nervous we might have to, but now we're actually gonna be able to continue trapping until March, 2025. So huge news for our teams and, and our technicians, but yeah, that's really exciting. Um, another bit on that too, is that with this funding, we're actually gonna be doubling capacity. So capacity in these regions right now and what that looks like is one full-time trapping team in Clackwood Sound, which is three folks, and one full-time trapping team in Souk Basin, also three people. So we actually trap from a vessel and we trap at high tide. So those trapping teams are gonna be able to continue for another couple of years. And with this additional funding, we're gonna be able to add another trapping team. So in Clackwood Sound, that's gonna look like another boat that's actually gonna look at targeting Northern Ahousat territory and moving into Heshquit First Nations territory as well, which is another nation in Clackwood Sound. And then in Souk Basin, we're gonna have another trapping team too, targeting that population. So the jobs that are created and sustained through this project, there's 10 full-time folks and five part-time folks. So no volunteer efforts in this project at the moment. It's all um, folks who are employed in either a full-time or part-time capacity. So since November, 2021, we've captured 404,000 green crab in Clackwood Sound. So what it looks like for us is we trap in Lemons Inlet and Tranquil River Estuary. Those are in Tolokwit territory and then Bedwell and Cyper River Estuaries in Housat territory. Um, the largest density populations are at Cyper River Estuary and Tranquil River Estuary. Um, the start of this project, what our what our day to day looks like is we take out 40 commercial style prawn traps and drop those in the shallow subtitle um, and intertidal zone, making sure that none of our traps come out of the water. And so when this project started, it was pretty astounding and shocking. We knew we had high density populations here, but nowhere near, I think, what anyone expected. So in 40 traps. In Cyper River Estuary on the first day we dropped, we captured 10,000 green crab just in those 40 traps. That looks like upwards of 500 green crabs in one trap, um, which is pretty startling. Um, yeah, and basically we, we monitor over time. And so we go to one site every week. So the team drops on a Monday, they pull, collect data, redrop the traps Tuesday through Friday. And Friday, the gear comes out of the water, is cleaned, and out of the water for the weekend and then we go to the next site so each site is trapped once approximately once a month for five days in a row with about a 24-hour soak time so yeah as i mentioned the team's been trapping full-time except for holidays and weather days since november 2021 and then in souk basin this is all on south first nation territory and um, as i mentioned you can kind of see just to the left of the screen there that kind of closed um, entryway which is why green crab aren't really recruiting or their larval supply isn't really coming in this area, but there are a lot of green crabs, as was mentioned. So this is a really high priority area as souk, the green crabs can leave souk basin. Seems that the, the larva of that genetically independent 
population is popping up in the states and in other areas in BC. So yeah, really high priority area for protecting the Salish Sea from further green crab introduction. Um, we've captured 161, 605 green crab in Souk Basin. So less than in Clackwood Sound, but still really startling numbers, um, especially knowing it all came from one introduction. Um, yeah, and same thing here. So the same trapping procedure happens, which we can then directly compare to Clackwood Sound catch too. So the data that we collect every day, or I shouldn't say we, the data that I'm very grateful that our field teams collect every day um, is temperature and salinity. They record the depth of every trap. They count and sex every green crab that's captured in every trap. We also yeah, record the sex, we count them, and then uh, a subset of the population is measured. There's no way the teams can measure every crab. Unfortunately, I wish they could, but they can't. So depending on what site they're at and what the daily catch looks like, they'll measure all of the crabs in one trap. And then depending on time, they will um, potentially measure more than one trap as well. Um, we also were at the start of the project comparing commercial style prawn traps to a modified commercial style prawn trap. And we tested that style for a whole calendar year. So November, 2021 to 2022. Um, what we did was completely cover a commercial style prawn trap and weight it to make it more protected and, and covered. We did run stats on that and we've stopped using that trap as the there wasn't really any significant difference in catch, sex ratio, um, or age class. But um, yeah, so it wasn't really worth, the juice really wasn't worth the squeeze on that in terms of management and the effort it took to modify those traps. We also take GPS coordinates of every single trap as well. And as an environmental measure for this project, we do eelgrass monitoring, which currently looks like drone mapping. So we collected drone imagery the summer before we started trapping at all of our trapping sites and two control sites in each region. And we've done that again every year since. So we're able to look at orthorectified images of each location and um, look at potential changes in eelgrass. So next steps for this project, as I mentioned, um, we have been funded now, or we will be funded by BC Surf to increase our efforts, which is awesome and really, really excited about that. We're also going to be implementing more exploratory trapping across the WCVI. So that'll include Barkley Sound, Nooka Sound, Cayuca Sound, Quatsino Sound as well. So we're working with um, Indigenous partners up and down the coast to see what that looks like, talk about priority areas, things like that, which is how we chose the sites that we trap at currently. So obviously we prioritize salmon, but also prioritize food, social, ceremonial, fisheries, and cultural area of cultural importance to our Indigenous partners. The point of that basically is going to be so that we can continue our pilot project, come up with a really effective um, management suggestions to provide to DFO and other partners, advise future management, and then with this exploratory trapping, get a better idea in other locations where we know there are green crab. We really want to indicate what those hot spots are um, and provide that support to our Indigenous partners in DFO. We're also doing some training and capacity building for early detection monitoring right now, which we just received funding for at the end of last fiscal year. So just in March of 2023, uh, CRS is working closely with the Pacific Salmon Foundation on that as well. So we're working with nations like the Nambies First Nations, um, the Atlagay Fisheries Society and the nations that they support, um, Songhees, Malahat, a lot of nations and areas of the Salish Sea and the Johnstone Strait that um, are concerned of further spread of green crab as well. So yeah, working with partners to drop off um, and provide more gear. So more similar to what the gear is that Leah and her team are using. So minnow traps, folding prawn traps, things like that. Um, just to provide to nations so that they can do their own trapping, um, either through guardian programs or volunteers to keep an eye on further spread in those areas as well. Um, if you do want to get involved on the on the Canadian side, um, either in Vancouver Island or anywhere else, what I would suggest is contacting DFO to report sightings. Um, so there's just a, a website there. So if you are out walking around, you find molts or crabs, just take pictures and contact DFO. Um, you definitely want to record the location, observation date, and identifying features um, of those crabs. You're also welcome to email me if you have any questions about our program or um, 
yeah, if you have any questions about getting involved in, in work with this, with this sort of thing, or um, want to be directed to any sort of resources in your local community. And then there are some awesome resources as well. The Invasive Species Council of BC has um, multiple modules to learn about green crabs and courses you can take if you were wanting to get involved in a scientific level of trapping. So you can follow that link there. And I can also maybe send to Marg and um, to get sent out to email lists if you'd like that link as well. And I also always recommend iNaturalist. I think it's a really awesome app and I really would like to see more people using it because it's really interesting to go on and, and track green crab on there if you're a citizen scientist looking to get involved in um, identifying species. But those would be my recommendations. But yeah, my email is always open if um, you want to chat about working with green crab on the island. And yeah, that's it for me. I hope I didn't use too much time and, and hit some of the things you guys wanted to hear about, but happy to answer any more questions any of you have. Thanks. Thank you so Hello. much, Krista. I guess, yeah, go ahead, Walter. You got a question? Yeah, um, no, we, um, in our lifestyle, we, we, we're consumers of seafood quite a bit. And we do a uh, trap. Uh, we have a number of traps for, for um, uh, king crabs in the north, but uh, but also for the Dungeness in particular, and we can take the rock um, crab too. Now you you make it very clear to us that this is a widespread program uh, problem that's uh, becoming um, larger by the day. It's uh, obviously they've infested the, the total waters right around Vancouver Island, and uh, and it's uh, further north than that. Could we as um, now? What were the prospects? If we could do a finer mesh on our crab traps, would the green crab likely enter the crab traps as well? And could we then um, separate them and uh, uh, in a recreational way? So I'm thinking um, perhaps another step would be to get all the thousands of um, people on the coast that, that harvest crabs to do a finer mesh and um, uh, take the green crabs out as they see them. Is that a possibility or not practical? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and you know, I think a big problem with the green crabs and why they aren't being found more readily is because of that mesh. But also in, in literature, it says that green crabs aren't often found deeper than six meters. Um, we've definitely found that that's not quite true. We've found them, I mean, uh, the director of our organization has found them at 200 feet before. So I think um, we really need to open up the concept that green crabs are taking up more environment than we would expect them to just based on scientific literature. So another problem is, is that for the most part, adult Dungeness and adult red rock crabs have a bit of biotic control over green crabs. And green crabs do like those kind of estuarine environments. So you won't often find green crabs at this population or at this density in the same place where commercial fisheries are trapping for Dungeness and red rocks. They'll be more in the shallow waters as opposed to that. So we're catching a lot of our green crab, you know, up in estuaries. They'll really manipulate going right up even to into rivers as far as that kind of the salt water influences. So you'll catch them in yeah, six to 10 feet of water really heavily. In the summer, you do see them move up higher into that upper intertidal. And then in the winter, you'll see them move down into that more deeper water down the shelf. So those estuaries. So that's kind of the trick is that you're not really going to catch them, or I shouldn't say you're not, but you're probably not going to catch them at that density. But what you can do is on a recreational license in BC, you're actually able to capture on each license 75 green crab a day. So there is potential that you can go out and, and trap and catch them. What we use is just commercial style prawn traps. Or you could use recreational prawn traps and drop them and catch green crab and take them out. Um, I would just, from me, recommend that you are in contact with DFO still if you are catching them. It's just really important data to collect is letting them know you've caught them. But yeah, within your recreational license, you're allowed to trap and remove that many green crab a day. Um, you can try out where you might catch larger crabs, but if you are looking for green crabs specifically, I would encourage looking in um, those more shallower estuaries. 
Thank you. We'll try the prawn traps, which we also have, and use it that way and um, see what we can find and um, remove from the system. Thank you. Sure, and, and I'm happy to connect you with um, the DFO AIS department too, if you have questions about um, what else you can do to get involved. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your question, Walter. Um, and thank you for your answer, Crystal. That was really great advice. Um, we, uh, Yvonne also has thrown in some links into the chat. Um, some of those uh, like uh, online uh, training that the Invasive Species Council has, iNaturalist and uh, DFO webpage for the green crab as well. Um, yeah, if there's any more questions, if not, we could move on. I will be giving a little bit of an update on our end here um, in the White Rock area and what our trapping efforts have kind of been so far. So hopefully everyone can see my page here. So yeah, so we started our uh, trapping in the Blackie Spit area on April 12th. Uh, we started with uh, some DFO field training. Um, we had some folks come from DFO to train our community volunteers uh, who had done some mandatory online training through the Invasive Species Council website that Krista mentioned. Um, and we had about 20 volunteers show up that day, which was really great. So we have them on a roster signing up to uh, different trapping sessions that we have set up throughout the summer, which is awesome. We've really appreciated their help in this. Uh, we have four trapping locations this year, same as last year, but one location has slightly changed as well, um, but is kind of in the same Blackie Spit area. And then we have a couple other um, trapping sites throughout the like one in Sawasan and one in Little Campbell River too. Um, just the one in Blackie Spit had changed slightly this year. Um, this is just a little bit of an overview, a little map of where we're trapping at the moment. So we've got the two sites uh, in the Blackie Spit area. Um, one, the new one is the Pebbles Point back channel and Little Campbell River or Tataloo is uh, one of our other sites that's coordinated by Arosha Canada. Uh, so they have their own little team trapping there. And we have an additional site at Centennial Beach in Sawasan. Um, so far, uh, the number of trappings we've had to date, um, Blackie Spit is at about two. Centennial Beach, we've had four trappings. Pebble Point back channel, we've had two so far and Tadaloo is at one. So we have uh, nine in total trappings to date, which is pretty great considering we're full volunteer effort. Um, and yeah, so we are still taking volunteers. If anyone on this call wants to join us, you can <laughs> send, send us a message. Uh, but yeah, so far so good considering uh, we'll be trapping for a few more months still. And to date, we have uh, actually trapped one green crab so far at the Pebble Point back channel. Um, unfortunate to hear, but uh, still really great data to have uh, since it's new, newer in this area. And our trappings will be continuing until uh, September at least. So yeah, join us if you can. That was it for me. Um, if Marg, you'd like to close us off. Yes, I, I'd like to express great appreciation to our speakers, Krista, Ali, and Leah. Thanks so much. And also to Carly for joining us from the city of Surrey. Um, and I would like to also uh, thank Deanne for all her hard work getting the webinar put together. And thank you very much. She's been such a great help to me. I have a number of things I I can't get to now. Uh, so Deanne has been an amazing saving grace. And also to Yvonne, I'd like to thank her as well. So anyway, great thank yous to everyone. And I'm hoping 
that the recording, once we have the link for the recording of this, we can uh, send it out to our various contacts so that we can uh, widen our, our reach um, of this important information from our US and um, Vancouver Island um, fellow trappers. I, th I think the, the information has been amazing and very informative even to myself. And I've been around this now for, uh, this is our fourth year. So very interesting. So thanks so much for sharing everything with us. And it will get out there into to more people. So anyone want to say anything else? But we'll wind it up. <laughs> All right, a couple thank yous in the chat. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, Yvonne has a note that will also have a narrated presentation meant for teachers and school groups that we'll share as a follow up, um, just so everybody's aware of that too. It's fabulous, fabulous. Thank you. That'll be great. I think the more we can reach out and, and uh, inform about this destructive creature, I think that we're going to see a lot more progress in early detection. <laughs>